Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm already exhausted just from doing that. <laughs> and I've heard this is great, so I'm really excited. Thank you to, um, to YAF and to also to the Herbolds. Uh, Robert and Patricia Herbold uh, sponsored this event for me, which is, is great. Um, I try to keep my speeches as short as I can because I really come here to talk to you. I want to hear from you, and I hope you'll ask questions. Uh, ben Shapiro always tells people if they disagree with him, to come to the front of the line, uh, but Ben's speeches aren't guaranteed 100% correct. <laughs> so if you disagree with me, just sit quietly and try and figure out where you went wrong. <laughs> they always tell you to open speeches with a joke, and I'm actually going to do that. Unfortunately, it's not a very funny joke. And even if it were funny, when you explain a joke afterwards, it kills it. And I'm going to tell this not very funny joke and then explain it. So this entire experience should be a nightmare. <laughs> Here's the joke. A guy dies and he goes to hell. And the devil shows him three rooms and tells him to choose which room he's going to spend eternity in. In the first room, he sees people planted on their heads on concrete. In the second room, he sees people planted on their heads on broken glass. In the third room, he sees people just standing around having a cup of coffee, but they're standing in excrement up to their knees. He says, well, it's hell. It's not going to be great, but I'd rather sit around having a cup of coffee and standing up. So he chooses that room, and the door closes and locks, and a voice comes over the intercom and says, coffee hour's over, back on your head. Oh. <laughs> All right, that was, that was a four, I think, five. The point of the joke is that the condemned man has no perspective, right? He has to make a decision that's going to have long-lasting consequences on very, very little information. And I tell you that joke because it's a perfect metaphor for being a young person, being about the age you guys are now, right? This is the time in life when you have actually the least information about what you should do, but you have to make the decisions that are going to last your whole life. You've got to make decisions about what you're going to do for a living, who you're going to marry, whether you're going to have kids or not. And you've seen so little at this point that you don't even really know what you don't know. And you can make big mistakes. This is why Bernie Sanders has a lot of young people following him, right? They, they look at freedom and they think it's hard. It's like standing on your head in concrete. And at least in socialism, the crap only goes up to your knees. <laughs> now, there, there are people around who try to give you perspective. Uh, technically, these people are called old people. And you can tell old people because they keep saying things to you like, when I was a boy, you know, I had to walk 10 miles in the snow to get to school. And who cares, right? I mean, if the guy wasn't smart enough to be born when there were cars, what business is that of yours? <laughs> and it, it's really, it really is true. We old people find ourselves in this kind of strange situation is that you actually do learn things over time. You actually, if you keep your eyes open, you do become wiser over time. But on the other hand, we have no idea what your lives are like, really. We have no idea what young people's lives are like. Things change so quickly. We can't tell the difference between Instagram and TikTok. We don't know what, what it's like to have a date in this current society. But we want, what we're trying to tell you, what we're trying to hand on to you is not really that we walked to school 10 miles in the snow. What we're trying to tell you is we're trying to give you a little bit of that perspective. We're trying to tell you that there weren't always cars that things weren't always the way they are now, and they won't always be the way they are now. Because when you come into a situation, you think it's just the way things are. But situations are really fluid. You think people are just standing in their knees, uh, up to their knees in, in crap. But things are going to change. So today, I'm going to talk to you about God. And <laughs> you may or may not be happy to hear that I'm not going to tell you whether to believe in God or not. And I'm certainly not going to tell you how to worship God. And I'm not even going to tell you who God will allow you to sleep with. If you want, you can invite Matt Walsh and he'll tell you all those things. <laughs> but what I am going to discuss with you is the role God played in creating the world that you're in. And the ways in which you think about God are going to affect the world that you go into and what happens to the world going forward. And I'm going to talk to you about this because I feel that nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about it from a political point of view. And what I'm trying to do, really, is just convey to you that the situation you're in is fluid. The things you have that you love, 
may not last. The things that you have that you hate may not last. Nothing is going to be the same 10 years from now. And a lot of it is going to have to do with what you believe and the ideas that you bring to the table. Now, the minute you start talking about God, the first question everybody asks is, well, the first question everybody asks is, who can I sleep with? But the second question everybody asks is, is which God are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus Christ. And the reason I talk about Christ is because in some sense, every single one of us is a Christian. Nowadays, we like to say that we're Judeo-Christian because we love our Jewish friends, but we're lying to them. Uh, we're not Judeo-Christian. This is a Christian country from a Christian that grew out of a Christian civilization. Now, the minute you say that, the minute you say, is this a Christian country? Is this a Christian nation? You usually can start an argument. And the argument is usually political in nature. And one of my favorite sayings that I made up is politics makes you stupid. And the reason political conversations make you stupid is usually you're in them to win them. You're not in them to listen. You're not in them to discuss things. You're not in them to learn. You're in them to defeat the enemy and hear the lamentations of his women. So when we talk about, are we a Christian country? The minute you start talking about that, what people start talking about is the founders. Were the founders Christians? Which founders were Christians? How many were deists? Why did Thomas Jefferson cut all the miracles out of his copy of the Bible? Uh, why did John Adams say that we weren't based on Christianity, but he said our constitution is only fit for a moral and religious people? Were there the values that went into our documents, were they Christian values or were they enlightenment values? None of those questions matters. Not one of them matters. Every single one of the founding fathers was shaped to his core by Christianity because every single person in the Western world was shaped to his core by Christianity. Christianity dominated the formative centuries in which the modern West was made. As I'm sure you know, Europe started out being called Christendom because it was where the Christians lived. And you knew you were in Christendom because if you said, hey, I don't believe in that, they set you on fire. <laughs> The West was shaped by Christianity in the same way you and I were shaped by our childhoods. You can rebel against your childhood values. You can change your childhood values. You can have new values. You can come back to them. You can stick to them. But whatever happens till the day you die, you will have been shaped by your values, by your childhood. And that will stick with you forever. And it sticks with the West that its childhood was shaped in Christianity. So what is the shape? This is great, I have to say. It's a great one. There's a new book out by a, a very, uh, an excellent historian named Tom Holland. And it's called Dominion, How the Christian Religion Remade the World. Here's a quote. To live in a Western country is to live in a society still utterly saturated by Christian concepts and assumptions. 2,000 years on from the birth of Christ, it does not require a belief that he rose from the dead to be stamped by the formidable indeed, the inescapable influence of Christianity. Whether it be the conviction that the workings of conscience are the surest determinants of good law, or that church and state exist as distinct entities, or that polygamy is unacceptable, its trace elements are to be found everywhere in the West. Now, what that means, and Holland goes into this in great detail, it's a, a doorstop of a book, what this means is that when a Western atheist and a Western Christian are arguing. They're both arguing through Christian principles. Consider this. Many Christians believe that homosexuality is a sin. Homosexuality has been declared a sin for most of the history of Christianity. But go on Google and find yourself a map of where gay people have full rights, and you'll be looking at a map of Christendom. Holland argues that the very category of, of homosexuality was created by Christianity. The idea that there could be a person who is a homosexual did not exist before Christianity. And I argued many years ago uh, during the real debates over gay marriage that the debate was essentially a debate between the Christian shall not and the Christian judge not. It was an internecine feud, a family feud. The same thing is true about the rights of women. You will sometimes hear our friends on the left or just atheist friends say that women are oppressed by Christianity. They cite biblical texts forbidding women to teach in churches and telling women that they have to submit to their husbands. But again, take a look at a map at where women have rights 
It's Christendom. It's a map of Christendom. Holland explains that the Christian approach to women was revolutionary. Aristotle thought women were nature's inferior version of men, but the Bible taught that men and women were both made in the image of God. Jewish law allowed divorce, which in a world where women were dependent on their husbands was basically cutting them loose, leaving them with absolutely nothing, but Christ forbade divorce. No one had ever thought of the idea that fidelity in marriage apply to men. That idea did not occur to anybody until Christ reminded people that man and woman become one flesh and the church decreed that marriage was a sacred state that required both men and women to be faithful. You can see the mind working that creates equal rights for women over time. So think of Christianity as a spiritual nuclear blast. It begins, there's white light, everything is destroyed. Old customs, an old way of thinking, everything is just wiped out. And then the radiation starts to spread out. It sinks into the skin. There are mutations that are born. And even when you go forward and when people have forgotten about the nuclear blast, those mutations become new kinds of creatures. They don't even know that they were formed by the blast, but they remain formed by the blast. So this creates a problem when we deal with cultures formed by other religions. And at this moment, we are dealing with problems of the culture created by Islam. Now, I'm constantly getting tagged by the left as Islamophobic, a word that has literally no meaning in real life. Nobody has, nobody has a phobia about Islam. They're worried about the violence that has occurred in the Islamic world. And I want you to understand that nothing that I'm saying is about Islamic people, Islamic persons. An Islamic person can be a wonderful, wonderful person, and a Christian person can be a terrible, terrible person. We all know this, or it could be vice versa, or either way, right? What I'm talking about is ideas and the powerful effect they have on cultures over time. So recently, the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, made a speech denouncing Islamist separatism in France, the idea that Islam Muslims can live in France but not participate in French culture. Here's part of what he said, okay? In the Republic, the Republic of France, obviously, in the Republic, it is not acceptable to refuse to shake hands with a woman because she's a woman. In the Republic, we cannot accept that someone refuses to be cared for or educated by someone because she's a woman. In the Republican Republic, it is not acceptable to drop out of school for reasons of religion or belief. In the Republic, one cannot demand virginity certificates to get married. In the Republic, we must never accept that the laws of religion can be superior to the laws of the Republic. And then after he says that, he pauses and says, I want to, after I've said all this, it's not a question of stigmatizing any religion. What we do not want to do is have a program against Islam, that would be a profound mistake. Now, in the French Constitution, it states that France is a secular state. So Macron has the legal right to tell French Muslims that they can't break the law for religious reasons. But here's the problem. The entire idea of a secular state is a Christian idea. It never existed in the minds of men until Jesus spoke the words, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. Before that moment, religion and the state were one. They were intertwined. They were inextricable, okay? The greatest controversy throughout the Middle Ages as Europe was taking shape was the controversy over who had the power to appoint bishops, who had the power to put the crown on the head of the king. Was it the church had the ultimate power or the state had the ultimate power? And that created a world in which you could discuss church and state, in which you could say, well, there's got to be a separation of church and state. That entire idea couldn't exist until Christianity had created the idea that there was a secular world and a religious world. There's a very thoughtful book called Islamic Exceptionalism by Shadi Hamad, who is at the uh, Brookings Institution, which is kind of a center-left institution. Hamad points out that unlike Jesus, who was a dissident, Muhammad was both prophet and politician, and more than just any politician, he was a state builder as well as a head of state. 
Not only were the religious and political functions intertwined in the person of Muhammad, they were meant to be intertwined. To argue for the separation of religion from politics is to argue against the model of the very man Muslims most admire and seek to emulate. This is where you get Sharia law, the idea that the law and the state must be ruled by Islam. You don't have the separation of church and state. And as Hamad points out, the Quran is different from the Bible because the Bible is supposed to be inspired by God. But the Quran is written by God. So every word, every letter is his word. It can't even be translated into another language. I read the Quran in English, but that doesn't mean anything. You have to read it in Arabic to understand it because that's the language God wrote it in. We can translate the Bible because we think the ideas are what we're passing around. And we don't think the words themselves were written by God, just inspired by him. None of this means that a Muslim can't be a good Frenchman or a good American. What it does mean is that when he is a good Frenchman or a good American, he is conforming to norms that grew out of Christianity. Even when we say that Islam is a religion of peace, we're saying that it must conform to an idea about religion that arises from Christianity. We don't even know we're doing this because the effect of Christianity is in our very skin. It's in our pores. We don't know. We think what we're doing is we're being incredibly tolerant and loving, and we are being incredibly intolerant and loving, but we're being tolerant and loving in a specifically Christian way because we don't know any other way because we're all Christians. Now, here's a funny thing, okay? The book I'm talking about, uh, how, how Dominion has the subtitle, How the Christian Religion Remade the World. But the author, Tom Holland, is from England. And in England, the book was published with a different subtitle. See if you can spot the difference. There it's called Dominion, The Making of the Western Mind. Holland told the Wall Street Journal, British editors are more prone to worrying that the mention of Christianity on the cover of a book will frighten the horses, which is an English expression for cause social trouble. I wrote a series of young adult adventure stories uh, called The Homelanders. It was sold, it was published here in America, but it was sold to England for a lot of money. One day, I got the manuscript back from England, edited, which never happens. Usually, they just publish the American edition. I said, why did you edit my manuscript? And they said, well, we want you to take out all the references to the Bible and to Christianity. It was written, it was a young adult novel written for a Christian audience. It starred a Christian young man who occasionally made references, like at one point, he was being chased by the police and by terrorists, and he had to steal some money to stay alive. And so he would make a reference like, yes, I know the Ten Commandments, but I need the money to stay alive. That's what they wanted taken out. When I refused, and I had to refuse five times, when I refused, the biggest bookstore in England cut their orders by, down to like a tenth. The book died the death because it wasn't in the bookstores. And I've, I have not been published in England since, okay? What I'm trying to tell you is that Europe does not want to identify itself as Christians. When the European Union, after all I just said to you, telling you that they were formed by Christians, that they are the, the, the continent formerly known as Christendom, when the European Union was formed and they for, wrote the Constitution, they refused to put any reference to Christianity in it, in it. The priests wanted them to say, oh, it has Christian roots. They wouldn't do that. They won't use, as you probably know, they won't use the term when giving the date B.C. or A.D., before Christ, or in the year of our Lord. They won't use that anymore. They have B.C.E., before the Common Era, and C.E. in the Common Era. But the division between B.C.E. and C.E. is the birth of Christ. So they're just lying. <laughs> Why do they do that? Why do we hold Christianity to different standards than other religions? Our friends on the left get furious if a Christian, if Mike Pence says that homosexuality might not be optimum, optimal, they hate the guy. They, they're ready to, to uh, take him out and, and set him on fire. But Iran, in Iran, they still execute homosexuals and they defend that pro practice. And you don't really hear about that that much from the left. You know, they don't really complain about that very much. The book The Handmaid's Tale, which I'm sure you know is a TV series, is based on the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979. That's what it's based on when the Iranian mullahs came in, brought the country from the modern world back into Islamist rule, and women lost all their rights. That's what the book is based on, inspired by. But the villains in the book are Christians. Why? 
I don't know if you've ever seen the movie V is for Vendetta by the guys who made The Matrix. The evil Christians hunt down a gay man who speaks lovingly of the beauty of the Koran. The Christians are the bad guys. The Koran is beautiful, whereas, of course, in real life, it would be the other way around. Why do we see oppression in Christendom, in the Christendom that made us free, while ignoring the oppression in other religions and even becoming angry at people if they point out the oppression and calling someone Islamophobic? Why do we do it? We do it because we're Christians. Because Christianity teaches us not to condemn the other man, but to search our own souls. It tells us, don't remove the speck from another man's eyes before you've removed the plank from your own eye. It is unchristian to criticize the other guy's religion, but it is Christian to search for the flaws in our own religion and condemn our own flaws. We're in a bind. We're in a paradox. It's kind of a riddle. It's a little complicated to follow, but once you get it, you see the problem we're having. To say that we are a Christian people seems unchristian and judgmental, which goes against ideas of secularism and tolerance that are all Christian. We try to solve this riddle by turning it around. Instead of acknowledging that we are Christian people, we simply say that other people are really Christian. They too can be secular. They too respect women's rights. They too have a religion of peace. We erase the difference between us by imposing our values on them without even knowing that we're doing it. We think those values just dropped out of the sky. We think they're just human values, just common sense. Of course, there's a separation of church and state. Of course, women should have equal rights. Who would not believe that? What kind of savage would not believe that? So everyone must believe that. God wants us to be peaceful. Who doesn't think that's true? This paradox became a serious philosophical problem after 9-11 and after the massive influx of Islamic migrants into Europe, which has caused a, a rise in the uh, rape, the incidence of rape, the acts of terrorism in Germany, England, France, and throughout Scandinavia. No one wanted to condemn the Muslim migrants because that would be unchristian. But then how could you get the Muslims to adhere to Christian rules like respecting women if you couldn't criticize them because you're a Christian. So several important thinkers began to recognize that they had to solve this riddle or the West would die. They acknowledged that their values were connected to Christianity and they began to write books about the need to acknowledge that connection. A very fine example is a book called Why We Should Call Ourselves Christians by an Italian philosopher and politician named Marcello Pera. Here's what he wrote. This is shortly after 9-11. He wrote, the West today is undergoing a profound moral and spiritual crisis due to a loss of faith in its own worth, exacerbated by the apostasy of Christianity now rife within Western culture. Without a religion of man as the son and image of God, liberalism cannot defend the fundamental and universal rights of human beings or hope that human beings can coexist in a liberal society. Basic human rights must be seen as a gift of God and hence pre-political and non-negotiable. You all recognize that as the ideas from our declaration, right? We are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, and to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. No government on earth had ever been instituted among men for that reason before ours, right? That was an idea that had come out of Christianity through the Enlightenment. Now, here's the catch, and it's a big catch, all right? Marcello Parra was saying, we have to call ourselves Christians because our values were Christians, and if we don't acknowledge their source in Christianity, we can't defend them when migrants come in and do terrible things that we disapprove of, okay? Here's the catch. Marcello Parra is an atheist. His book is called Why We Should Call Ourselves Christians as opposed to Why We Should Be Christians, okay? He can't believe. He, he wants to keep the concepts that grow out of Christianity, but he can't believe in Christianity, which I totally respect. Same is true of the writer Douglas Murray, who wrote, he's a controversial, conservative, gay British writer, who wrote a wonderful book called The Strange Death of Europe and a recent book called The Madness of Crowds. He calls himself a Christian atheist. That's the term he use, uses. He wants the values of the West, but he can't believe in the source of them. And their problem, Murray's problem and Paris' problem, they're not being bad people, right? Their problem is rife throughout the West, especially among intellectuals. Even the people who acknowledge that Christianity is the source of our values can't believe in it. Resurrection and healings and miracles, 
These things don't happen. Civilized people in a scientific world can't believe in them. Even if they want to believe, belief won't come to them. They can't force it on themselves, and they don't want to lie about it. And I truly do respect that. But I disagree with it. To me, to be a Christian atheist is like seeing footprints in the snow, but refusing to acknowledge that anyone walked there. It doesn't make sense. I became a Christian because when I acknowledged that my values were Christian values, and when I decided that for those values to be objectively true, there had to be a God, I realized that my God must look very much like the Christian God. So I was baptized because it made sense. Because the world does make sense. This is an important point that we don't think about enough. The world makes sense and we can make sense of the world. Our logic actually applies. If you walk north, you get to Canada. If you walk south, you get to Mexico. Not sometimes, every single time. If you do math right, you get the right answers. If you calculate the trajectory of light, you will find out exactly where light is going to land. The world makes sense and we can make sense of the world. So when we're talking about reality, we have to make sense. That's how you know when someone's talking about reality because he makes sense. So I'm frequently asked by people, especially conservative people, can I be a moral person without faith? Can I be a free person without faith? And sometimes can I be a conservative without faith? And my answer is always the same. Absolutely. Yes, you can be a moral person without faith. You can be a free person without faith. You can be a conservative without faith. But you cannot be those things without faith and make any sense. How can you believe in God-given rights if you don't believe in the God who gave them? Women, speaking generally, are physically smaller and weaker than men, and men can get a great deal of pleasure out of abusing and oppressing them, as we see in the news every single day. How can we claim that men shouldn't take that pleasure unless we believe that women have the same God-given rights as men because they were made in the image of the same God as men? And the reason people don't like to believe these things is because they have ramifications, right? If a woman has inherent rights simply by the fact that she's alive, then when she has another life inside her that is not her own, that life also has rights and things become very complicated. Without God, there can be no absolute morality. Thinkers as diverse as Shakespeare, the Marquis de Sade, and Friedrich Nietzsche have all realized this is true. Without God, we decide what's moral and what's right to one person, may be wrong to another. It's all relative. This is where you get the idea of multiculturalism. The multiculturalists say that our culture isn't morally better than any other because morality is relative. So you should treat other cultures with kindness and respect. But if morality is relative, why should you treat anyone with kindness and respect? If morality is relative, what makes kindness and respect better than unkindness and disrespect? If there's no God, all bets are off. The strong can simply use the weak for their pleasure because that makes just as much sense as the opposite. What I'm trying to tell you is the problem that we have in our political conversations today is that no one will acknowledge the source of our values. And so no one knows what our values really are or should be. No one knows the basis of their own arguments. We can't reach consensus because everyone's afraid to lay out the rules of the game. They're afraid to talk about Christianity and politics because it's not Christian. Either there's a creator who gave us our rights or our rights are null and void. Either our creator is the sort of creator who gives men and women equal rights or he's a different sort of creator and we have to reconsider what our rights might be. And either we are made in some sense in the image of that creator or we're meat and chemicals. We can be drugged into happiness or butchered into whatever sex we happen to feel like or exterminated in the womb when no one particularly wants us. We are afraid to bring Christianity into the conversation because it seems oppressive, unkind, and judgmental, and we do not want to be oppressive, unkind, and judgmental because we are Christians. Somewhere along the line, our reason has lost its reason. If we are going to find our way forward in a new and rapidly changing world, we have to go back to the source and start to ask ourselves the hard questions as we begin again. Thank you very much. Don't tell Shapiro I said any of that. Okay. <laughs>
So my question is, is one of the big problems that we see is the, the social fabric of America is fading. And mm. a lot of it is because people have, a, so I, I'm a Christian, uh, people have a negative stigma when it comes to church, whether it be bad experiences growing up or just going to a bad church or just feeling judged. So what would you suggest to someone? So, you know, I'm, I'm no longer, I graduate, I'm no longer a student. What would you suggest to someone who, uh, wants to build a social fabric uh, for people to maybe learn about the Christian values that maybe don't want to come to church. And, you know, on a college campus like this, it's very easy to find organizations and clubs to join. But, you know, once you're in the working world, what sort of uh, social fabric would you suggest uh, building in a society where a lot of people would never go to a building just because it's called a church? Yeah, I, I am really in favor. It's a great question. And I'm really in favor of a uh, home churches, small churches, where people get together and discuss the Gospels and discuss the Bible. I know some of the smartest people in the world are doing this, like in, in some of the greatest colleges, universities. They just get together to talk about it. And the reason I feel this way is because I feel that churches do get sclerotic. They get hard and inflexible and old. And not everything in Christianity is actually Christian. Barnacles attach to a religion as it moves through time. I mean, you know, there was a point that when if you were a Christian, you believed that uh, lightning came from demons. Well, you get rid of that as some Science tells you differently. You don't have to stick to the superstitions that accrue, that attach to a religion. You can get rid of some of those. There are some really important questions facing a new and modern world. Uh, and, and I think that those are not questions that are going to be worked out by institutions necessarily, uh, because institutions have a, a um, stake in not offending their donors oftentimes. And so I think that people getting together in small groups to sit around and say, what does this mean? Where did this come from? Because as I say, everything you have comes out of that. And so at least understand what you're rejecting. At least, you know, people should at least understand what it is that they're rejecting. And I think the best way to do that is to learn and talk about it with people who know. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so my husband and I, we're obviously we're pro-life because that's where you should be. Um, but a lot of times it comes to conversations with my liberal family where they, we have to avoid all religious aspects of this conversation. It's like, we're going to just go around this bubble of religion and we're just going to hit you with science. But how can we tie that religion in without them immediately rejecting it and saying, oh, that's just flim flam. Okay. Well, well, actually, I don't believe that uh, Christianity should be the basis of any argument with somebody who's not a Christian. You really have to convince them of the things that they actually secretly believe without knowing they believe. I was, you know, I was uh, uh, pro-abortion when I was young. I grew up a liberal, and that was just kind of a, a, a category of faith. And one night, a Catholic friend and I got into a massive, friendly, friendly, but massive argument that went on till two or three in the morning with a lot of beer. <laughs> and I, as I staggered off to bed, I remember specifically thinking, I lost that argument, and he never used religion. He simply used reason, and I lost the argument. It took me, it took me decades to accept that I had lost it because he was right, because to hell with him, you know. Yeah. But, <laughs> but no, but as I accepted it, I changed my mind. I changed my mind extremely reluctantly. I'm a natural libertarian. I want people to be free. <laughs> But I changed my mind because I lost the argument. So I think that you have to you have to meet people on their terms. I mean, the Christianity actually teaches us that to be all things to all people. You have to argue people with people or debate with people on the grounds that they accept. And so, the, like the question I asked, if if a, a woman is weaker than a man and yet has the same rights as a man, what is it that takes the rights away from that baby? In the old days, in the old days. Even Christians, Thomas Aquinas, believed that the baby was not alive until it had a heartbeat because he didn't have a sonogram. He didn't know. Now we know. I'd like to know what your relatives think of the fact that this, you know, I know. <laughs> I know. It's very difficult. Listen, but the only, the only thing is, is you can't live to convince people. You can only live to state the truth. You know, that's what you have to live for. And, and you have to let them go their way. But my only, my answer to your question is that you can't bring religion into a conversation where the people don't accept the premises 
that you're on. Hello, Andrew Clavin, Master hey. of the Multiverse. Thank you, Marilyn. <laughs> I'm sure your answer will 100% change my life for the better. Of course. I, well, I don't promise for the better. I, I, <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so I'm a graduate student here in the political science program, and I deal with a lot of students on a regular basis. And I'm a conservative myself, but a lot of my students are liberals. And they refuse to accept the idea that I can be conservative and nice. As well, my fiance uh, works for a different university. And her supervisors refuse to accept the fact that she's also conservative and a sweetheart. Like, she's, my fiance is the best. I'm sorry. I just want to let you know she's the best. So how would you suggest going about approaching these people and convincing them that you can be conservative and nice at the same time? Well, again, because I get this question a lot, how can I convince someone that blank? You can't. You can't convince anybody of anything if they're not willing to listen and uh, and change. What you can do, though, is you represent. You know, you are the person that you are. You explain why you believe what you believe. I, listen, I get that. I live in L.A. I worked in Hollywood. I get this all the time. And once you start to explain to people why you think the things you think, those people who have open minds will at least say, all right, well, that makes sense. You know, it's very hard right now to find common ground with people. And the thing that Reagan said where he said it's not that liberals know nothing, it's that everything they know is untrue. <laughs> that, that that is really true. I mean, that is really true. I was I was I was speaking with one of my agents the other day who is like a far, far lefty, and like every word out of his mouth was just factually wrong. You know, and at some point you think like, uh, you know, I'm not waiting into this anymore, you know, like it's just ridiculous. So in, in your case, I think you have a real uh uh, step ahead because you're probably a nice person. Your fiance sounds like she's a lovely person. So, so she just has the, all she has to do is be and, and not be afraid to speak. This is, this is, I think, our biggest problem. I do not understand. I was, I was talking uh, to the guys from YAF before coming up and they were saying, yeah, this is most, more, there are more conservatives here, but the liberals are louder. I shouldn't call them liberals because they're not liberal about anything. The leftists are, are louder. That seems to me to be true everywhere I go. Everywhere I go, the social cost of being a conservative is much, much higher than the social cost of being an absolute lunatic. Okay? <laughs> and so, and so it, what, what is required of us is not actually convincing people. What's required of us is the courage to speak politely, quietly, insistently that what we are saying is true. I mean, listen, I, I seriously, I got kicked out of the movie business because I would never allow anybody to assume what my position was. And I was always, incre I'm, I, I happened to be a tremendously polite human being in real life. And like, I, I, I would just always very politely say, no, that's not what I believe. And you know, it costs, it costs. We have to have the courage to pay that cost or else we get nowhere. Thank you. So uh, I'm missing my Bible study to be here. Um, did I make the right choice? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, in all seriousness, uh, I've been a listener of your show since the very beginning, like I think like episode 12 or something like that. Uh -huh. um, and so kind of over the years, what's kind of been like the hardest thing about making a show like that? And also like, what have you really loved about making a show? Well, I, you know, one of the things I really have loved about the entire experience was the experience of working with the people that I worked with, especially as we took this place. I mean, I, I was telling the story before coming on, but it's worth retelling that we started out in Jeremy's pool house, the changing house to his pool, me and Ben doing a 15 minute show each on a card table. And it's four and a half years later, and we're now essentially a major television station or a minor television station, but a real television station that goes around the world, you know. And that has been a tremendously exciting experience, and it was tremendously exciting to be with people uh, like Jeremy and Ben and even Knowles, uh, who were just a, a delight, a, just a delight to be around and to smoke cigars with and talk and, and drink and talk theology, which is almost all we did, uh, theology and politics. And that was just uh, something, uh, so help me not to get too religious, but there are times when I could literally feel the spirit just hovering over us. Once we got really successful, unfortunately, we don't even have time for that anymore. Knowles and I occasionally meet up for a cigar, but we've kind of dispersed because we're all traveling at the same time. The challenge for me has been, I, I, all I ever wanted to do was write. That's all I ever wanted to do my whole life. And that's all I really, you know, that's when I'm, I feel like I'm doing what I was sent here to do when I'm sitting and writing. The idea of being in front of a camera never, ever occurred to me. The idea of being somebody people would recognize in airports 
never, ever occurred to me. I mean, it was really the whole thing about being a writer is that you can become successful and have your work do well, but nobody knows who you are, and it, which is great, you know? <laughs> it's like, and it changed my life. And I, I, it, was, it was challenging, you know? It's like, um, I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I've really loved doing it. I've really loved reaching the number of people you reach when you do it. And I know from the letters that it has meant a lot to people to have somebody like me who has come from a different place to get to where I am. And so I've, when you travel a long road, you see a lot of the bad turnings that people go down. And so that's given me a kind of advantage over, you know, a guy like Ben, who's always believed exactly what he believes and has known what he wanted to do. Having traveled this long road is, gives me insights that people don't have. And those have been really useful to people. But it, to sit in front of a camera and talk was a genuine challenge for me. I mean, it was kind of like, wh- how, it, was like it was like that dream you have where you wake up on stage in your underwear, you know? I was like, like what am I doing here? Now I'm used to it, but uh, it was really a change. Oh. Oh, thank you. Good evening. Hi. Uh, due to current demographic changes, uh, due to mass immigration, how can the Republican Party win another national election in the future? I, yeah, this doesn't this doesn't worry me at all. You win by having better ideas. I mean, Donald Trump has now it, weirdly because Donald Trump doesn't seem to me to have a theory of politics. He has ideas about politics and he has instinct. But the Republican Party has reformed around him and has become a much more viable party in the future. Listen, the world is is multi-ethnic and the world is going to become multi-ethnic. And unlike Europe, where some of the countries were formed on racial lines and they have some small argument to make about their racial component, we were never formed along racial lines, not from the very beginning. I mean, George Washington said we weren't. Uh, all, the, all the founders knew that the slaves would one day be uh, citizens. If we can't, if the Republicans can't deal with that, uh, they can't deal. But I think they can deal. What we're offering is good for everybody. The question we have to stop answering is, what are you going to do for me? This is the question that uh, that frequently I get asked by African-Americans. They say, well, what has the Republican Party ever done for me? And I was saying, nothing. <laughs> Isn't that great? You know, that's like that's a good thing. When the government does stuff for you, they take stuff. They're always, it always costs you something in freedom. Listen, you know, I, I hear people say sometimes uh, it, we should we should stand for blood and soil. We should stand for our you know race, and we should stand for this instead of this creed, this vague creed stuff. Nothing is more specific than our creed. Nothing is more vague than the idea of race. You've got it exactly the wrong way around. Our creed is a very very specific creed. It has been good for everybody who's ever touched it. Anybody who's ever touched it, it's like magic dust. It turns their life better. It makes them richer. It makes them stronger. It makes them freer. You can't sell that to people of different colors. You're just not a very good salesman. All right. Thank you. A wise and powerful bald one. (laughs) (laughs) That's actually on my business card, yeah. (laughs) Um, So I have two things. One, can you give a shout out to my baby sister? You're her hero. Uh, Her name's Kirsten. She can't be here tonight because she's still in elementary, uh, not uh, middle school. Kirsten, how you doing? It's great to see you, and I hope you'll come next time. (laughs) And then the second one is, do you have any tips for someone who's trying to write a book in, uh, in his free time, specifically when it comes to adding Christian things to it, but in a subtle way, not like a slap in the face, kind of like J.R.R. Tolkien or your book, uh, Another Kingdom? Yeah. Um, is that the, that's the specific advice you want, is how to deal yeah. with Christian uh, themes? You know, one thing you can do is just promise not to mention it. It almost always falls flat. You know, Alfred Hitchcock said in a movie, the two things you should never show is somebody making love and somebody praying. And that's because those are internal experiences and you can't really show them. It's very hard to convey that stuff. It, one way you can do it is just force yourself not to mention religion and let the themes carry you. You know, don't, you sh- the thing about a story is a story tells itself. You got to let the story tell itself. And when you try to impose Christianity on it, you may do violence to the story. If you see the world in that way, your story will have it in there, and you should trust to that. All right. Thank you. Sure. Hello. My Hi. name is Sarah. I help run the local YAF chapter at our high school here in town. Um, and my question for you is, I'm also kind of a writer myself, and has it been especially difficult getting started in that business, being a very open conservative, and what has been your experience trying to put yourself out there in a world where that's not always accepted? Um, well, first of all, I, when I started out, I wasn't an open conservative, so I think I had an advantage there. 
Um, I was always uh, going against the grain without knowing it. I didn't even know what the grain was because I was paying attention to the stories I was telling and all this stuff. Writing is a wonderful job and a, an extraordinarily difficult profession. I tell people all the time, first of all, if you don't have to do it, don't do it. If you don't have to do it, do it in your spare time. I, like there, there are certain people in this life, I unfortunately am one of them, who have to do it or we will just explode. This is why I'm here. I'm here to do it. I have to do it. But it's really tough. And the other thing I tell people is there are literally more active major league baseball players than there are people like me who make a living doing it, you know? So it's like, it's a very hard thing to do. However, however, it can be done. And nowadays it can be done in a lot of different ways. The traditional publishing is under fire by the fact, by, by independent publishing, which has grown by leaps and bounds. You, if you are an open conservative, are you writing fiction? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, because if you're an open conservative and you want that in your fiction, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make life harder for you. It's just going to make life harder for you. If you are a conservative thinker, there are places to go, and there are lots of places to go. And the, the thing that has changed the most about publishing since, since I was young is that the author has become more important which as you can probably guess from hearing me talk, I, I didn't like very much. It was not a development I was happy with, but it used to be that you sent your book in, the book was published, your picture was on the back if you wanted it to be on the back. If you didn't, it wasn't, you know, you just sent the book around. You might take a, you might do an interview for, with a newspaper, but, but now you sell the book. And so one of the things that will really help you, I'm, I hate to say this because it goes against my grain, but uh, building a social media life, building a place where you can go and reach people to sell your book, people who will turn up for your book, even writing your book online. That's the way the novel The Martian was written. He guy just wrote the book every day and people came to it and finally they said, put a tip jar in there so we can pay you for it. And finally it became a major bestseller. That was also true of Fifty Shades of Grey, um, 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 unfortunately, but... Um, <laughs> But so, so what I'm saying to you is the, it's a hard road. It's a really hard road. But there are so many different roads to get there now that if you pay attention and you read about it and you get books like Writer's Market and things like that, you can find ways to get where you want to go. Most important thing is be good. Seriously, be good at what you do. I mean, uh, it, it's amazing how many wannabe writers I know want to know how to meet people and how to make contacts and how to, you know, set themselves up, but don't know how to write an English sentence. So, thank you. Sure. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of research on the political polarization that we see in politics within the United States today. And my question for you is, how do you believe the political polarization that we see in the country today plays into the taking away of these God-given rights? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tremendous threat. I mean, when, when you have what is now called hyper-factionalism, uh, people look for t tyrants to, to solve the problem. This is what happened in Rome as the Republic was falling, as the factions became in, in irreconcilable. Uh, tyrants seemed to bring peace and they stopped the fighting and they, you know, bring everything under control. So it's a real threat. The reason we have hyperpartisanship, I believe, is because our government has become too powerful. So we've lost the right to control the government Bef before really the 1960s, the government, the federal government didn't have that much power. So a conservative and a, a leftist could argue and be friends because not that much was at stake. Whatever they were doing in Washington, D.C. didn't really affect you all that much. Now, every Supreme Court decision changes the world. So every time there's a, a, an appointment to the Supreme Court, people go insane. You know, it's not supposed to be like that. The, the government was supposed to be small, limited, have powers that were listed in the Constitution and no other powers. That's the source. That and the administrative state where they can pass a regulation and run you out of business. That's the source of our hyperpartisanship. That's why we hate one another. And so I think to, to dial back the hyperpartisanship, the way to start is to start to take away the power of the, the administrative state, start to destroy. I mean, it's funny. Uh, we were at... 
I can't remember some some conservative uh, shindig where we all the Daily Wire guys were there and they took us aside and interviewed us individually and said, what's the one thing you want to change? And we all said, I'd like to bulldoze the Department of Energy and the Department of Education and the Environmental Protection Agency. Just want to get rid of all those agencies because they are the things that have taken away uh, are the democratic process that allows us to be friends when we disagree. And so it's a, it's a serious threat. It hasn't reached those proportions yet, but it's a serious threat because people will prefer a tyrant to civil war. Um, being a conservative, my political views are based almost entirely on my Christian faith. And when I'm in political debate, I find it very hard to not go back to those Christian principles and those roots. And I was wondering if you have any advice to kind of working around that and trying to get your point across without necessarily pointing right at Christianity. Yeah, you have a big advantage. The big advantage you have is there is a God. So when you are speaking from a point of view that there is a God, you will make sense. So all you have to do is just step down, go down a step and talk about the things that make sense. Like I said, with a, a, a abortion, you know, you can talk about the fact that separate DNA is a separate person. If a medical examiner comes into a murder scene and finds two different kinds of DNA, he knows two people were there. That's the kind of argument you could make. And if, if the person seriously doesn't believe that a human person has the right to life, you can't argue with them. You know, there's just, there's gaps you can't get across. But most of the time, that's not going to be your problem because people don't know why they think people have the right to life because if they don't believe, but they, they kind of think it's true because they're Christians, because they Christians without knowing it. So you can make that argument. You can make every argument you want to make about that, that starts with God, except the argument that there's such a thing as truth. Once you're talking to someone who will not acknowledge that there's such a thing as truth, even language has no meaning, you know, so there's no way to argue with them. But anybody who's be, hasn't become that decadent and corrupt, you can you can reach them without talking about God. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi. I'm a liberal atheist. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <though. laughs> um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the secular state is a Christian idea. Yeah, if you go back in uh, history, the state what and the religion were one thing. If you, you know, the, the emperor would become a god when he died. Uh, the, the religion, there was, no, there was no place where you went away, where the religion didn't exist. The idea when they come to Jesus and they give him a gold coin and they say, you know, should you pay taxes to Caesar, which was idolatry to the Jews, and he said, whose face is on the coin? Give it to Caesar's face is on the coin. Give it to Caesar, meaning God's face is on you. You are made in God's image. Give yourself to God. That's that's a whole new thing. Nobody had come up with that answer before. It simply didn't exist. And if you follow that thought, like the the idea that there could be a church that would fight with the king, like in the investiture crisis in the 12th century, the king said, well, I appoint the bishops. And the pope said, no, you, you don't. That's... You know, that, those are the things, these are the things of God. You control the things of Caesar. That was the entire Middle Ages. That's They had that argument for the whole Middle Ages, right? The idea of Henry VIII fighting to get a divorce because he couldn't get the Pope. He was the king. He should have been able to do anything. You know, Caesar didn't fight with the Pope. You know, so, so that entire idea that there was such a thing called religion and such a thing called the secular world only grows up. In Christianity, and and as uh, Hamad Hamadi says, it doesn't exist in Islam. Hi, uh, I'm glad they have pictures of your face on all the posters around here because I keep forgetting how to spell Clavis. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, when they put those up, people write on my forehead. They write, <laughs> "You're fascist." <laughs> uh, so my question is: uh, a lot of the com uh, arguments about socialism are on whether it works or not. Um, I think that even if it does work, it's still evil. So how, how do you, I guess, change the conversation to be, uh, take a step back and look at, even if it does work, it's well, still wrong. Well, here, here's the thing. You know, if, if there were no leftists, conservatives would be the stupidest people in the country. You know, I mean, it's like we're constantly making these practical arguments when the real question is moral. And leftists don't do that. They make the moral argument all the time. And that's why they sound like they're doing the moral thing. But of course, so, I mean, socialism is the idea that you go to work and then somebody more powerful than you decides how to spend your money, right? 
which is also the idea of slavery, right? You go to work and somebody <laughs> more powerful than you, also in a big white house, decides how to spend your money, you know? That monologue, and, and, yeah. and the important thing, and the important thing about money is that money is time and time is life, right? You make your money, you paid money for what you do with your time, and your time is all you've got. So if I get to choose how to spend your money, I, I own your life. I own your life. And so when we sit around and say it doesn't work, it's like, that, that isn't the point. It doesn't work. I mean, it is nice that it doesn't work. That does help us. You know, it's always nice when they're roasting cats in Venezuela and, you know, and Bernie is going, oh, Venezuela, they have reading and they have reading. Yeah. <laughs> cats are good. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so that's, that's helpful to our argument. But you're absolutely right. In every one of these situations, ta high taxes, you know, all of these situations, we make the practical argument when we should make the moral argument because we are the moral side. And, and that's why I frequently, you know, sometimes I'll come to these things and there'll be a lot of hecklers and a lot of protesters. And I always start with one statement. I always start, all I want is for you to be free. And virtually everybody agrees with that. And once you start reasoning from that, what you have to do to be free and the fact that when people give you money, you're not free anymore. When people give you free stuff, you've lost your freedom. You know, those are arguments you can make. That's the moral argument that counts. You're, you're, you're absolutely, it drives me nuts. I mean, my, my favorite example of this is Paul Ryan wanted to cut back on entitlements, which is something we're, you're going to have to do. You guys are going to have to do it because we, we're boomers and we suck. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Paul Ryan is sitting up there with a, this pointer, the Republican pointer. I think they issue these to you when they find out you're a Republican. They give you a pointer and he's pointing at the graph and all this. And the Democrats go out and they make a video of a guy who looks like Paul Ryan pushing an old lady in a wheelchair off a cliff. And I thought, that's how you tell that story. <laughs> I, thought, I thought the guy's talking about people who are 65, 65 year old women aren't in wheelchairs anymore. They're playing tennis and doing yoga, but it doesn't matter. You know, you tell that story. So we don't know how to do this. We don't know how to tell stories. We don't care about stories. We don't know how to speak morally. And we've been suckered into fighting materialist battles, um, which is just a mistake. So how do we make that argument with the base level of like, I guess, social safety net uh, of socialism that we do have? You know, it's funny. I, I'm, I'm somebody who thinks that, uh, I think actually Frederick Hayek said this too. Um, I understand that the social safety net is a compromise, is compromising your principles. But the social safety net keeps people from panicking. And when they panic, they'll go all the way to the left. That's what gives Bernie, it, it's really a problem because once you accept the social safety net, you're always fighting to keep it in check, you know, and nobody ever gives any money back. That's not something that happens. But unfortunately, and like I said, Hayek did say this, that if you don't give people a social safety net, they will panic and they won't remain free. And so it's a, a little price you pay for keeping people free. Amazing. Thank you. Sure. Hi, how you doing? Hey, good. Um, I first want to thank you and all the Daily Wire people. I uh, really appreciate what you do and oh, keep it up. Um, thank you. So lately I've been learning a lot about like living in the flesh um, and like going to like partying, drugs and sex and then living for the spirit, like using Christ to fulfill your life. Um, so what advice do you have um, for like, I have people in my life who are like struggling with making that change. Um, like they're believers, but they haven't like switched over yet. Yeah. So like, what would you, what would be your advice for them or me as a friend to like try to help them go from the material world to like a spiritual world? The, the thing that has always helped me in these matters is to look at the positive thing I'm trying to do and not the thing that I'm trying not to do. So, you know, I, I love alcohol. I love whiskey. I don't like I don't like getting drunk, so I, that keeps me from becoming like a stone alcoholic. But I do love a drink. You know, at the end of the day, I love having a whiskey. So when when I wanted to get control of that, because I had lived in England where everybody's drunk constantly, you know, and I thought like, oh, wow, this is getting a little out of control. I, you know, I didn't think like, okay, I'm going to fight back against this. I started to think like, well, how do I want to feel? What do I want to feel like? I want to feel when I wake up in the morning that I can face God. You know, I want to feel that when I pray, I'm not like praying like you know, <laughs> this hangover. I want to not be enslaved to this thing. I want to be in control of this thing. And if I can't be in control of it, I don't want to do it. So I started to just think positively about every positive thing that I wanted. And that really helped me to get there because I really do feel, I, I believe in obviously that you don't want to pollute yourself with all this stuff, but the church focuses too much on what we shouldn't do and doesn't focus enough on what we're trying to achieve. What I'm trying to achieve, and I will tell you like in one word, what I'm trying to achieve is joy. 
You know, I mean, I know that I am in the spirit when I feel joy, which is pretty much all the time. And by joy, by the way, I don't mean happiness. I don't mean I like a big yellow smiley face, which would be, then I'd just be nuts. You know, <laughs> what, I, what I mean is that, uh, that feeling that this is great. Life is great. Even when my heart is breaking, it is great to be alive. You know, the comparison I like to make is like if you go to a movie and there's a sad scene and you're weeping, but you walk out and say, that was a great movie. That's the way you should feel about life. And that's the thing I'm always trying to achieve. And these things get in my way. And so they, I look at them as, as things that I got to get past to get to the thing I want, not things that I have to get away because they're evil. You know, don't, oh, don't look at that picture because it's, you know, because that to me, then I just want to break that rule. You know, I don't like being bossed around, even by me, even by God. I don't like being bossed around. I want to be a free man. And so I want to go toward something, not away from it. That's, that's what works for me. And, you know, I don't know if it's helpful, but. No, it is. I agree. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here, Andrew. My question is, I have a family member who currently now lives in California and has been entirely absorbed by the culture and philosophies and everything. Um, But we have been somewhat of estranged because I grew up in the foster care system, so I grew out of the home. But I'm trying to rebuild this relationship with them. But yet I have conservative ideals, conservative beliefs. And I'm just trying to rebuild it. I'm wondering, is there a way we can without always clashing heads? Maybe. Uh, it, it, it really depends. There's only, you can only do one half of the job, right? So if he, he won't do the other half, no. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's really, this is a hard thing to accept, but you're not in control of other people, and it will make you much happier to learn that. Once you learn that, you, you'll be a lot happier, you know? Like, I mean, I've lost, I've lost many, many people who are very close to me uh, because of my political opinions, occasionally because I, I said things I shouldn't have said, you know, occasionally my fault, but, but most of the time just because they can't tolerate the difference. The thing is, not, you don't have to, that's not what you have to be talking about. You know, if the guy is in trouble, you should be talking about that. If the guy has aspirations, if you have aspirations, there's so many things you can talk about without talking about politics. You can avoid politics and religion, you know, uh, and, and the, the world has gotten to be such a political place. And leftists have this terrible habit of assuming that what they're saying is true. So it, it doesn't bo- they, they don't think it's insulting for them to say Trump is an idiot. But if you say, you know, Obama is an idiot. Oh, my, oh my Lord. You know, you've done a terrible thing. So you may find yourself in that position, but just avo- avoid it. You know, I mean, bring, bring the love. You know, the guy sounds like he needs your love. Bring the love, you know, and like see if you can care about the rest of his life and not talk about that. And if he won't let you do it, there's nothing you can do. Um, so what would you do to try to curb the conversation if they brought it in? Well, I I do this all the time. I say to people, there's no point in us talking about this because we're not going to agree. There's just no point in our talking about it. And when I'm forced, as sometimes people force you, the one, it's a great piece of advice, by the way, this is real. this really works. It's a great piece of advice. Refuse to talk about individuals and only talk about principles. Don't talk about Donald Trump. Don't talk about Obama. And it's so tempting to do it. You want to do it. So, you know, because they'll say, oh, Trump did this. And you'll say, well, Obama, you know, it's like, (laughs) don't do it. Just talk about principles. You know, what I want is this. The reason I want the government to be small is this. The reason I love freedom is this. The reason I think our founders did, you know, but just avoid people like the plague, because that's where you'll never, you know, you'll never get to any point of agreement. Thank you very much. (laughs) Sure. In the ideal society, uh, I think that, uh, it's the liberals' job to uh, create uh, new ideas and uh, like propose things. And I think it's the conservatives' job to uh, like look backwards at, in history and see, uh, no, we already tried that. Let's not do that. That didn't work. Uh, do you think like if today's society were different, you would be like a liberal or conservative? Or uh, you know, it, it's ac- I actually almost agree with that. I mean, I think that leftists, what leftists do is they spot problems and, and injustices. And what conservatives do is they fix them in ways that are in keeping with the traditions of the country, because the country will change, but you want it to change in keeping with the traditions of the country. That's the idea, right? So the, the leftists will come around and say like, oh, there's racism. Let's burn everything to the ground. And conservatives will say, well, that, you know, that's not actually that good an idea, you know, maybe, but, but there is some racism. Maybe we can get that out of some of our institutions, you know, and that's, and that's the way that works. I can imagine, the only way I could imagine 
at this, well, I, I can't imagine being a leftist. I am a liberal. I'm a conservative because I'm a liberal. I really feel like people should live the lives they want. Uh, they should do what they want. I don't care who people sleep with. I don't care if, they, I, 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 because of, because of the fact that I'm as old and wise as I am, I can tell you some of the choices you make are going to absolutely screw you up forever, you know? But it's not, I don't feel like I should have control over people. I feel that freedom is a really important thing. So the only reason, way I could picture myself as being a liberal is if conservatives owned the culture and were as oppressive as leftists have been. If conservatives were saying not just we should believe in freedom, but you can't say anything else then I would be saying, wait, you gotta let them, you gotta let them speak. I agree with you on the points, but I, but you have to let them speak. And we would do that too. The minute people have power, they ruin themselves. <laughs> but, um, but right now we have no cultural power or about 5% of the cultural power. So like, it's just easy to be on a, a full, cons full fledged conservative. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Mr. Clavin, thank you for being here. Iowa State, thank you for having us. Um, I don't go here. I'm old. Um, my wife loves, listening to you. Um, specifically, she loves when you talk about motherhood. Huh. Um, she's college educated, way more intelligent than I am. And yet she is living her life at home with our children. And when you talk about motherhood and we talk about the value of, of raising children, she just eats that up. So I don't have a question, just a comment <laughs> and just thank you for doing that. Uh, it's a huge uh, blessing to her. I'm, I'm really happy to hear. I'm really, I thank you for telling me that because sometimes I feel like I'm uh, on this subject. I feel like I'm spitting into the wind. I mean, uh, there, there are lots of uh, young ladies who work uh, around me who like have a baby and come back to work. And I'm like, you're nuts. You're nuts. You know, and it's like, I, I, I think um, it, it's interesting. One of my favorite line, uh, passages in a poem is in Wordsworth's The Prelude when he talks about a, a child uh, being nursed by his mother, learning uh, to actually interact with the world in love and learning that, that love is, is part of the creation of the world. They have now found out that that actually happens in people's brains and babies' brains when they interact with their mothers. To leave that behind because you've got a job on TV or in a business, to me, it's insane. But, you know, I'm not in charge, and uh, I'm, so I'm glad that some people yeah. agree with me. Yeah. Hi, Andrew. I had a question on the rise of communism and socialism. A lot of the leftists and liberals I talk to on campus here don't really seem to know who Stalin, Fidel, <laughs> and those guys really, what they stood for, and that they killed dissidents and did all these terrible things. And I was wondering if that has to do with uh, modern, edu uh, modern education or why they would believe in communism or socialism, but not fully know the evils of it. Yeah, that's exa it's exactly what it has to do with it. You, you know, it, it is tragic what has happened to universities. I don't know this university. I don't know if it's, it happens at this university. But Howard Zinn's book, uh, uh, the, His the People's History of the U.S., which is just a screed against America, against freedom by a full-fledged communist, is the best-selling history book in the country. It's taught in schools. And Hollywood sells it. I mean, and, and it's nonsense. It's, it's absolute nonsense. Um, and and so, uh, yes, you have been made ignorant by people. You, you've been schooled in ignorance. You know, remember, my generation actually went out in the quad and shouted, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. And we won, you know. So, so you know, the, these are people who haven't accepted the fall of communism. They haven't accepted, you know, it's just next time it's going to really work out great. They, they know that they're in a situation where their ideas will never be tested because they're in a university. A lot of them have, um, have tenure, so they're not going to get thrown out for saying idiotic things. They have done a truly, truly tragic thing to, to young people. It, listen, I, I, it, here's a place where I don't care if you're on the left or the right, okay? If, if you take an English class, if you take uh, or an English major, and you go through an English major and nobody teaches you Shakespeare, you've been cheated because like with the Bible, you are Shakespeare. You know, you think the way you think because of Shakespeare. And if they teach you instead some minority writer so that you get, that's not the same thing. You're not that minority writer the way you are Shakespeare. If you learn uh, English literature, you should learn English literature. They, they purposely are not passing down the intellectual culture, what used to be called the great conversation, which is the conversation between Plato and Aristotle and Nietzsche and Kant and all these people over the centuries talking to one another and fighting and disagreeing, 
but somehow moving closer and closer to a, a truth that's always farther away. They stopped the great conversation. And the result of that has been a, a sense of, uh, of homelessness, intellectual homelessness among the young. They do not know who they are. They think that they're one thing. They think they can be anything they want, and they do not know where they come from. And it's a sin. It was a sin to do it. It really is. I, I look at these guys, and I just think, how... Even if you teach it from a liberal point of view, how can you go in and not teach people where they come from? So that's why, yes, that's what I think. I agree right. with you. Thank you. <laughs> so if we could get one more wel warm welcome for Mr. Clavin for coming, that'd be great. Thank you, Thank you very much for